that's great. I see the live stream went on here. Bob, shall we start the recording? Uh, yeah, give me just a second here. Sure. All right. So welcome everybody. Welcome everyone in Stuttgart and Germany and here in St. Louis. Welcome to our virtual lecture series. Before we officially start, I would like to uh, take a minute and walk everyone through our technical setup today. This lecture will be recorded as we just heard and a link to this recording will be provided later on on our website. Our Zoom settings for today are as follows. During the presentation, all our guests will remain muted. This means our audience cannot switch on their microphones. Everyone will be able to submit their questions at any point of time during the presentation and during the Q&A time. Please feel free and very much invited to share your names and your organization in the chat box, which you find on the bottom of your screen, right in the middle for everyone who is here on Zoom today, not on the live stream on YouTube, of course. And then, Next to the chat box, also on the bottom, also auf Deutsch, auf der unteren Menüleiste auf Ihrem Bildschirm, you will find the Q&A button, the question and answer button. Please use the Q&A button for submitting your questions. So the chat box for your names and uh, point of contact and uh, the Q&A button for your questions. As for time, we plan uh, on about 30 minutes of presentation followed by a, Q a question and answer session. We plan to wrap it up around 7.30 p.m. in Germany and around 12.30 uh, local time here in St. Louis. On behalf of the University of Missouri St. Louis, also called UMSL, you see the uh, the logo here in my in my backdrop, UMSL pronounced AMSO for all of our German uh, guests here today. On behalf of AMSO, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the city of Stuttgart for their generous sponsorship of this lecture series. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the uh, of both sister city committees and of our German Culture Center at AMSO itself. And uh, another thank you to the, uh, to the DAZ in Stuttgart, the Deutsch Amerikanische Zentrum. My name is Liane Konstantin. I'm the interim director of the AMSO Global Office, which is the international office of our university. Um, I'm originally from Germany and I've worked for the German government and the German Academic Exchange Service for many years before moving to the United States eight years ago. And I've uh, been with AMSO for almost four years. My university, our university here, is a public research university. And for our German guests tonight, it might be important to know that the large public research institutions in the United States oftentimes see a relatively high percentage of so-called minority students, which is the term used to describe students of color. In this series of our events, you will see how this is relevant and important to us. Today, I'll serve as your moderator and if at all needed as your cultural translator as well. This lecture series on race and racism is a result of an invitation of the city of Stuttgart looking to facilitate a transatlantic discussion steered by academic and career experts in this field. Our university has welcomed this opportunity and we're excited about this lecture series, which intends to provide lots of opportunity for questions, discussion and intercultural learning. It is my great pleasure today to introduce our two speakers, 
Professor Dr. Sheikh Kirchhoff and Professor Dr. Doris Villarreal. Dr. Villarreal earned her PhD in curriculum and instruction from the University of Texas at Austin. She also participated in the Fulbright Hayes Group Project Abroad in Tanzania, which was sponsored by the US Department of Education and coordinated by the African Studies Institute at the University of Georgia. Dr. Villarreal has 13 years of bilingual elementary classroom teaching experience in urban public schools. That's impressive. <laughs> her experiences as a bilingual elementary teacher in Texas have led to her interest in the improvement and support of educational programs that serve students from diverse uh, cultural and linguistic backgrounds. Her research interests include biliteracy, hybrid language, language practices, and identity in linguistically and culturally diverse teaching contexts. That's a lot to, to read out. And thanks for the tongue twister, Doris. <laughs> uh, and, and her focus is also on Latinx children, as well as literacy teacher education. Dr. Villarreal is a Latina bilingual scholar whose family and community experiences afforded her a critical understanding of bilingualism. This perspective has informed her research in recognizing how language and race intersect and its impact on emergent bilinguals, uh, language and literacy learning experiences in the United States context. Over to uh, Shea Kirchhoff. Dr. Kirchhoff is an assistant professor of secondary education at UMSL in the College of Education. She holds a PhD from North Carolina State University in curriculum and instruction. Dr. Kirchhoff utilizes mixed methods to investigate critical, digital, and global literacies. Her research centers on integrating socially significant global issues with adolescent in literacy instruction. Her work has been published in many international peer-reviewed journals. And she currently serves as an assistant editor of a journal called English Education, which is a journal of the national, well, which is, uh, uh, what is it? Which is uh, the journal of the National Council of Teachers of English. Is that correct, Shay? <laughs> Perfect. So Shay Kirchhoff also serves as Going Global Education Director. In this capacity, she has worked in Central America India, Myanmar, China, and Kenya. In 2018, she was named a Longview Foundation Global Teacher Education Fe Educator Fellow. Dr. Kirchhoff is passionate about education globally and locally. I love that about your work, Shay. In our local community, she serves on the board of the St. Louis Regional Literacy Association and before moving to St. Louis, she taught uh, high school English in North Carolina and in the District of Columbia public schools. As a white teacher in predominantly African-American schools, she became interested in learning more about race because she saw how racism outside of school manifested inside of schools. And with that, I would like to hand it over to both of our speakers today and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Liana. So I am going to share my screen. We are very happy to be with you here tonight to talk about race and racism in school contexts in the United States. We're going to start by thinking a little bit about our own lives. And so this vase on the left represents my life. And each marble represents a person in my life. So one marble that represents me is the, the white peachy colored marble. And then I inserted a marble that represents a family member. So my family members that live here in my house with me are also all white. So another white marble was dropped in the vase. My neighbor on the side of my house is also white. So I dropped another white marble. My coworker 
I have many coworkers, many of whom are white, but um, Doris Villarreal is one of my coworkers and she identifies as Latina. And so this, this marble represents her. And my mechanic who fixes my car is white. Um, and my doctor is African-American. So I want you to think about what you're seeing in my vase. And I'm gonna let Doris share about her vase. Uh, good evening. I was about to say good morning. Uh, so in when you take a look at my vase, uh, I have, um, uh, you know, uh, white colleagues, white peers, white friends. Um, I also have um, a close uh, family and, and co-workers that are uh, Latinx. Um, and then some African American or, or black colleagues. And as I was doing this, just based on uh, what we're thinking about as far as uh, racial and ethnic identity, that I ran into uh, an issue of like thinking about uh, individuals who are biracial. And so, how would they be represented in my jar? Um, uh, and so, I was trying to think like, would we put half and half? Uh, how would we? Um, create that image. Uh, so what are you noticing about um, my jar, my vase in comparison to Shay's vase? And if you want to put that in the chat, you're welcome to. So what do you notice about the two vases? And we can see what you're saying in the chat. And then also think about your own base. So think about what color marble you would put in your base to represent yourself. What about your neighbor, your coworkers, your doctor, your mechanic? How many colors would be in your base? So the marbles in my vase were mostly one color. And this is what typically happens, um, especially with white people in the United States. Cognitive researchers talk about how we have an unconscious tendency to gravitate towards what is familiar. And so researchers have found that people tend to gravitate towards people who look like them. This is called affinity bias. People find it easier to socialize and to spend time with others who are not different. It requires more effort to bridge difference when diversity is present. And so our inner circle probably reflects our worldview, our values, our beliefs, our culture. We all wear cultural lenses, but problems can occur if we make assumptions based on our own past experiences or what we believe to be true based on our own experiences um, and the people around us, rather than the evidence that's presented to us. So what do you see here? And you can just think to yourself, what do you see? I was presented with a glass that looked similar to this when I was visiting China. And I thought, great, yes, I would love milk. And so please, I'll have some milk, yes. So I took a big drink and I was really surprised because when I thought milk, my brain unconsciously associated cow's milk as well as it being cold. So I assumed that what was being handed to me and what I would be drinking would be cold and would taste like cow's milk, but it was not. It was actually warm soy milk. So my past experiences caused me to make an assumption of what this was rather than the evidence that was provided in front of me. So what did you think it was? Did you perhaps think it was cow's milk like I did? 
Or maybe you thought, oh, it could be oat milk or almond milk, coconut milk, rice milk. There's many different forms of milk around the world. So I moving into that topic and thinking about uh, these immediate uh, like assumptions that we make, for example, uh, Shay thinking, yes, this is uh, dairy milk. Um, what I want you to do here, uh, this is a commercial um, on the around uh, the housing authority in the United States. And um, while uh, affinity bias and culture bias are both natural, these are unconscious tendencies. Uh, and then if they're left unchecked, this can leave, uh, lead to unintentional bias against people who are different from us. This can lead to essentializing uh, people, racist ideologies, uh, marginalizing the unfamiliar. So what I want you to do when we play this, uh, this video is I want you to take special note of the names that the gentleman is using and um, the reaction that he gets from the speaker on the phone. Uh, and also take special note of the accents in relation to the response that, um, that this gentleman is getting uh, for his phone calls. a few questions about the apartment on Park Street. What was your name? My name, uh, my name is Juan Hernandez. It's been rented. Oh, he's gone. Hello, my name is Sanjay Kumar. I am calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Not available? Hello, my name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. Just been rented. Hello, I am Chen Lin. My name is Khalid Bin Ali. I'm Tuan Vo. Hello, my name is Moshe Goldberg. I use a wheelchair. He's gone. Not available. All right, thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Yes. Really? Housing discrimination sure. is illegal. If you think you've been a victim because of your race, color, national origin, sex, religion, disability, or family status, call us. Fair housing, it's not an option, it's the law. Okay, so uh, what you notice in this video is um, when the gentleman was using the different accents, he was he was getting like the apartments rented, uh, it's not available. And so this leads us to think about implicit bias and uh, what that means. And so uh, to, uh, to bring us to a common understanding of implicit bias, um, I wanted to share with you a short video uh, that discusses implicit bias and, um, and it uses the, uh, the example of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term right here in American society. A lot of times, when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned, Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We'd never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm going to say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of 
black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing. If you're seeing this and thinking that it doesn't apply to you, well, you might be falling prey to the blind spot bias. That's a scientific name for a mental bias that allows you to see biases in others, but not in yourself. We're biased. <gasps> So as we continue our conversation today about implicit bias, racism, and how it shows up in our schools, we need a shared language so that we are all using the same language to talk about the same things. So thinking about others in terms of their group membership is called social categorization. And so as the people in the video talked about, this is a natural cognitive process where we place people in social, we place individuals into social groups and make assumptions, which is a guess based on what we believe, um, based on those associations. Social categorization occurs when we think of someone as a man versus a woman, and then what we associate with men, an older person versus a young person. And it also has to do with race. So if we see someone as a black person versus an Asian person or a white person. Once we use a social categorization to place an individual into a social group, we begin to respond to those people more as members of this group rather than who they are as individuals. Thinking of other people in terms of their social category membership is a functional way of dealing with the world. It helps us to make decisions quickly. Our complicated world is reduced sometimes to stereotypes. These stereotypes can be positive, but they can also be negative. And when we are treating individuals based on a stereotype rather than their own unique characteristics, this can be very unfair. It can lead to discrimination. And as we see this happening across people, across our nation, it becomes systemic. And we consider racism to be the systemic oppression based on race. So how exactly does implicit bias relate to schools? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. go ahead, Doris. No, 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 no. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first, let's give you a little bit of background about schools in the U.S. So our country is increasingly diverse. We're becoming more and more diverse racially. Um, and it's projected by the year 2024 that white will no longer be the majority if you categorize uh, other races as people of color. So by 2024 in our schools in the United States, white children will represent about 46% of the school children, Hispanic 29%, black 16%, Asian 6%, American Indian 1% and multiracial children 4%. However, <laughs> Teachers in the United States are overwhelmingly white. So 96% of teachers are white. And there's um, many reasons for that. But one reason is that in the past, schools in the United States were segregated by race. There were African-American schools, black schools that had black principals, black teachers, and black students. And then there were white schools that had white principals, white teachers, white students. When we stopped segregation, which was a good thing, there were some unintended negative consequences. And one of which was that the black students were sent to white schools. So the teachers there were white teachers with white principals, and then the students became integrated. 
but we did not do a good job of integrating our teaching staff as well. And so one thing that I want to point out is that what's important about uh, understanding implicit bias, that is if, the, if you don't uh, keep your implicit bias in check or uh, re critically reflecting on it, that uh, those beliefs, uh, those cultural practices and how we're informed uh, will, will impact children um, in schools and um, and, uh, and how that can occur in schools. Right, and so as we talked about affinity bias or um, the tendency to gravitate towards what's familiar, if the teachers are primarily white and the teachers have the power in the classroom and the authority and the decision-making, then their implicit bias, if left unchecked, can lead to white students having a privilege in the classroom because they share the same race and same culture as the teacher. So that's one example. Another example of how racism manifests in schools is microaggressions. And so microaggressions, as the video talked about explicit um, like Ku Klux Klan racism versus just not checking one's assumptions and letting one's biases dictate the comments or the, the behaviors that one makes. So a microaggression, here are some examples of what a microaggression is. Assuming parents don't care, assuming students don't care. So looking at a student and saying, well, that student just doesn't care about education, that's a microaggression. Assuming gender pronouns, assuming a boy wouldn't like a book because it's about a girl, or assuming that an African-American student would like a class, perhaps because it's about African history. So those assumptions, maybe each instance doesn't seem like a big deal, but microaggressions have been compared to a mosquito bite or a bee sting. One bee sting, it's annoying, it's a little painful, but you can brush it off but hundreds of, bee strings, hundreds of bee stings can actually be fatal. So when these microaggressions take place over and over and over um, as a child experiences school, they start to associate school with a place of pain. It also impacts their trajectory in, in school uh, and they begin to appropriate that identity that's been placed on them through these microaggressions um, as well. Right, so if teacher after teacher has assumed the student doesn't care, the student may say, well then why should I care if no one thinks I care? Exactly. There are statistics that show that systemically across the United States, black students attend schools that have um, worse ratings. Now, I want to be really clear that this is um, the, this is caused by funding and by um, resources, not because of the students being there. So the disparity begins in kindergarten um, and continues throughout a child's schooling because our school system, even though we were, even though we did go through um, desegregation, our schools are still highly segregated. Schooling in the United States is a local governance. And so students attend the school in their neighborhood. Um, and that school is funded by property taxes in that neighborhood. So impoverished communities have less resources for their schools. Um, and we have seen in the United States that um, wealth and race are correlated. So our school system remains highly segregated by race and economic status. Black students make up 16% of public school population, but the average black student attends a school that's 50% black. And that's because our neighborhoods remain segregated. Um, the average black student also attends a school at the 37th percentile for test scores, while the average white student attends a school in the 60th percentile. 
And these, um, these situations that involve race can follow a student throughout their career. So here, what you'll see is a, 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 it's a diagram, a model of implicit bias and the steps that it can have, that can happen. Um, so uh, often what happens in schools is that uh, black, uh, especially specifically black boys are um, more often uh, to get suspensions, more often uh, to um, uh, be weaponized. And so, uh, in these schools that are predominantly uh, uh, black and serving black and brown students, um, the behavior system um, becomes like no tolerance. And so then, um, so you have the school policy and then it's up to the teacher's discretion whether or not they're going to um, take and make any steps towards correcting that behavior. And then, um, and then based on those assumptions, that's the impact. Like for example, you're going to be suspended or you're not gonna be suspended. It's just gonna be a warning. And, um, and so what ends up happening is that uh, there's a disproportionate amount of black and brown uh, children um, receiving uh, behavioral repercussions, disciplinary action against them as, uh, as uh, compared to their white peers. Yeah, and we'll break that down a little bit more. So zero tolerance that Doris mentioned refers to a discipline policy where there is zero tolerance for breaking the rules. And so if a rule is broken, um, there is no warning, the student is immediately suspended. Black students are three to four times more likely than their white peers to be expelled, which means they're they are kicked out of the school and cannot return to school. They're also three to four times more likely to face multiple suspensions from school than their white peers. So why is this exactly? Well, going back to implicit bias, we can see that according to the Policy Justice Institute, research has shown that white students were more likely to be disciplined for provable documentable offenses. So they were smoking. They either were smoking or they weren't smoking. They got caught. The teacher saw them smoking, vandalism, obscene language. So there, they are, uh, there is evidence and it's very clear that that was a violation of the rules. While black students were more likely to be disciplined for more subjective reasons like disrespect. And so it's, it is not so clear cut it's more subjective. And so we see across these years that black students are more likely to be suspended for subjective reasons than, than white students. Not only does suspension mean that students are missing learning because they aren't in school for those days, but research has found that when students are suspended, they're more likely to be held back a grade and are at a higher risk of dropping out of school. Trouble at school can also lead to students first contact with the criminal justice system. So as part of the zero tolerance disciplinary policy that US schools adopted, they brought in police officers to the school. In many cases, schools themselves are the ones pushing students into the juvenile system because they are having students arrested by the school police officer while they're at school. This creates what we call the school to prison pipeline. Several studies have looked at the relationship between race, behavior, and suspension, and none have proven that black students are misbehaving at a higher rate than students of other races. So in addition to the school to prison pipeline, we also see less opportunities for black students to be incorporated into gifted and talented programs, advanced programs, accelerated programs, such as the advanced placement program in the United States that offers college credit for high school courses and the international baccalaureate, which is also an advanced curriculum. 
Um, and one, one aspect to add to this is that this advanced courses or like there's programs like the gifted and talented programs. And these are ways that white families could um, safely integrate into schools. But um, if, their, if their child was identified as like gifted and talented, they would get separate teachers they would have separate classes. So then even within a quote unquote integrated school, there was still segregation uh, happening because you would go into like, say like an advanced course or a, a, a gifted, gifted and talented classroom, it would be all white students with a white teacher receiving different services as opposed to their, um, their peers of color. Right, and so it's not because white students are smarter. It's because their teachers who are identifying them to be in the advanced classes are white. So the white teachers are able to identify and recognize um, talent in white students because it's the same the, um, culture as themselves where they may not be able to um, get past their implicit biases with other children. So, um... How is different taught in school, the difference uh, taught in schools? Well, that depends. Um, like Shay mentioned earlier, schools are uh, in the United States um, are local and they're zoned in, the, uh, in areas. So uh, depending on uh, the area that you're living in and the school that you're attending um, will uh, impact the type of curriculum that you are receiving. And so we have a uh, colorblind curriculum. And I have this uh, cartoon here where you have your, um, your typical looking racist uh, wearing a Ku Klux Klan uh, regalia. And he's like, at least I'm aware of my prejudice. Like, so, you know, like, I'm, I'm wearing this regalia because I know where I stand. Where as opposed to like say a color, colorblind racist, if you notice she has a, a blindfold and she's saying, well, I can't see, uh, I can't see your color, um, then um, I can't judge you. So um, there's this idea around like, I don't see color. So then um, like there's no idea, there's no recognition of like implicit bias. And so um, if we, yes. So why is colorblindness a problem? Because you'll hear that a lot in the United States. Like, I don't see color, you know, I just see my kids. And what that says is like, it's ignoring the way race continues to structural uh, life chances. Um, there's an idea that schools are mer uh, meritocratic and that everybody has the same chance and opportunity. And that's not true because uh, schools act as a stratifier in the way that, um, again, the way that students are tracked, the way, uh, what types of classes they get to take. And it recreates this uh, illusion of um, everyone has an equal chance. Well, if you just work real hard, um, you can accomplish uh, whatever you want. Um, but that's not, it's not the same for uh, children of color in the United States. And so that in and of itself reinforces racism. And so if it's, if it's truly, if everyone is truly equal, then it is logical to blame people for their lack of success. So if you're, uh, if you're adopting, so if you're adopting a colorblind ideology, um, it's like, so then you start blaming, well, uh, um, uh, I'll say, speak for myself, well, Doris didn't work hard enough. And so that's why Doris isn't successful um, it, as a person of color. And when you think about it in the United States, there are um, obstacles placed uh, for children of color to constantly overcome and, uh, and divert. And, you know, just like how we spoke earlier about these microaggressions, um, it's hard to break out of that, um, that shell that's been created um, that, that speaks for you. And so it's not that everybody is equally treated because it's not due to um, a lack of work um, and why they don't, why there's no uh, success. And so sameness does not equal equitable outcomes. So sameness would be equality where, and then versus equity. And so um, equality does not equal equity. 
Yeah, so just talking about that a little more, um, with, if, a, if a teacher is aware of color and aware of the systemic ways that students are stratified in schools, a teacher can check her own decision about who she is um, suggesting, recommending should go to advanced classes and say, I'm not seeing students of color on my list of who I'm, I'm recommending. I need to double check this. I need to check myself. I need to gather some evidence and make sure that I am uh, recommending students of color at the same proportion that I'm recommending white students. Um, and so again, like, so in um, adding to that and thinking about the notion of equality, so that means everybody's getting the same thing. So everybody has the same opportunity. And again, that's not the case in US schools. Um, when we think about the idea of equity, that means that, um, that resources or um, the types of approaches taken with uh, schools uh, that are predominantly black and brown uh, with black and brown students that uh, exerted effort is being made to in those schools to create um, a landscape that um, allows for um, opportunity, more opportunity for children of color. And so what scholars are saying around this that as like as far as seeing race is that teachers have to understand and work both within and around the culture of teaching and the politics of schooling um, uh, um, to really understand schools uh, because in US schools, uh, teaching is a political act. Uh, if teachers, and Latson Billing tells us, if teachers pretend to not see students racial and ethnic differences, they really do not see the students at all and are limited in their ability to meet their educational needs. So if, if not, so then what she's trying to say is in this instance, like if, um, if I don't see Doris as a, uh, a bilingual um, uh, student, then I am limited to uh, the opportunities that I am getting uh, because my uh, everything outside of uh, this whiteness um, is not seen or valued and that impacts uh, children of color uh, in their learning and their experiences in the classroom. So there are also schools that are adopting anti-racist curriculum, which means that not only are they advancing equity, but they are also fighting against racism by teaching about justice in the classrooms. And so we have this example for you. Among the many things the pandemic has exposed have been the deep social and racial inequities that run throughout the U.S. Add to that the killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and too many others, and the calls to address systemic racism have grown just louder and louder. So what better place to learn those lessons than in school? Christina Quinn has more. Back in June, when the Black Lives Matter protests first broke out in cities across the country, something happened. They kept going, radiating throughout the suburbs, popping oceans, and crossing borders. There was an undeniable momentum, one that teacher Joanna Chacon and her colleagues wanted to seize. This summer has opened up spaces um, in which teachers have begun to speak more openly and honestly about race in our school systems. Chacon is an English teacher at Newton South High School and was inspired by the work of Dr. Bettina Love, a pioneer of abolitionist teaching form of instruction rooted in combating systemic oppression and racism. So Chacon and her colleagues formed a book club to discuss anti-racist teaching that quickly evolved into an online conference. Within days, we had hundreds of teachers from, you know, seven states. You know, now we're in all 50 states and we're in 24 countries. Almost 6,000 teachers and counting are attending the National Educator Anti-Racism Conference. 
Katina Love and other education experts will provide training on how to create an anti-racist school and curriculum in every subject. Anti-racism means that I'm teaching lessons that go in depth about communities of color and doesn't just teach about the oppression those communities face. Lessons that Amani Fonfield, a rising senior at Newton South, says everyone should learn. In early June, she staged a die-in in front of Newton City Hall during a Black Lives Matter protest. She says conversations about race happen at her school, but not with everybody. And it gets frustrating when I'm the only voice, the only Black voice that has to represent a whole culture. And it's intimidating, and I don't think I should have to. Bonfield will be leading a students in anti-racism discussion this weekend. She's hopeful this conference is the first step towards lasting change. I don't expect us to have uh, the conversations around race normalized immediately. I do think that teachers will really um, reflect on what they've done in the past and, or what they haven't done. That level of introspection is why Kate Fussner is attending the conference. Three years ago, she changed her ninth grade English curriculum at Fenway High School in Boston to better reflect the largely Black and Latinx student population. My curriculum focuses on giving students choice to find what they love to read and to find their voices, their inspiration in living writers, um, in particular writers of color and queer writers. Fussner says this conference is an opportunity for white educators who make up the vast majority of public school teachers in this country to build on the momentum that teachers of color have built over generations. We need to be there to push each other and to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because ultimately I think that's what's going to move us forward. When the conference wraps up next week, the hope is that teachers attending will contribute lesson plans to a database accessible to any teacher who sees racial justice as part of their calling. Christina Quinn, WGBH. All right, and so that is just one example of many schools around the country who are bringing anti-racist curriculum um, into their local schools. So that brings us to the question and answer session of our presentation today. Um, and so we just wanted to set a few group norms. So um, we're going to listen actively to understand others' views and these will these will be taking place through the um, question and answer um, section on your Zoom. Um, group norms when talking about race is to criticize ideas, not individuals. Comment in order to share information, not to persuade. Avoid blame, speculation, sarcasm, and inflammatory language. Um, sarcasm, especially on in digital virtual spaces, through chat, through question and answer forum. Um, tends to, can be misinterpreted. And do not ask individuals to speak for their perceived social group like we saw with the student who said that she is sometimes asked to speak for black people um, and that's not fair. So what questions do you have? Well, thank you, first of all, Shay and, uh, and Doris. Uh, that uh, has been an eye-opener to me, another one, since this is the second uh, presentation, the second uh, lecture to, on our Race and Racism series here. And I also check out the book you just highlighted. Uh, <laughs> that, um, uh, that would be great. Uh, I have like, a, I don't see uh, many questions in the Q&A box yet, but as I told you previously, like prior to our start here, I had some people submitting some questions. And uh, if you are okay with that, I can just like start picking a few of them. Um, I was wondering what I would start with a couple of questions I already crossed out because so you covered it so well, uh, including, including, um, uh, facts and, and uh, details about school funding and how it, what is the reason for this uh, still so segregated situation we find in the United States. And um, so uh, my one question I got um, uh, from, uh, uh, from a German partner was, yeah, the school funding in the US was uh, so nicely wrapped up and coined by Condoleezza Rice's term, who uh, calls that zip code education. 
So uh, if you could spend a minute to explain to our German audiences, maybe you already said, well, it's like um, locally funded, but what exactly does it mean? Where do, do the funds come from? And how does it really tie in with like teacher salaries or how much is spent for the very district that you are in? Uh, so the uh, monies come from, for public education, come from property taxes. And so uh, one of the things um, that uh, occurs is that, um, say, for example, uh, a very, very large district will encompass these, uh, these zip codes in very affluent areas and also zip codes in, uh, in more impoverished areas. And so then the funds that come in from property taxes, um, at one point they're, uh, they're approaching the, the monies in the, uh, in the form of like a Robin Hood. And if you're like Robin Hood, like, you know, stole from the rich and gave to the poor. And so then uh, that money is supposed to be spent uh, equally across like a district But, um, but then you have um, white parents uh, saying like, that's not fair because my kids attend this school. Um, the money that we pay in property taxes should uh, stay within this zip code. Um, and so then like a, a, another problem that occurs is that um, in uh, areas that are predominantly uh, uh, black, and brown communities are becoming to, uh, beginning to become gentrified. And what I mean by that is that uh, white, uh, white families um, are coming in to uh, these communities, uh, buying up property, um, making, you know, like increasing the property value uh, and redoing um, the homes and everything. And so then instead of sending those children, their children to the school that they're zoned to, which would be a school ser that serving uh, low socioeconomic uh, students on free and reduced lunch, they in turn go send, they would uh, can send their ch kids to charter schools, private schools. So then um, that money, uh, like uh, in US schools, um, we get money per per student in the classroom. So then um, the less, the, the, the student population in relation to the amount of uh, funding that you get um, is correlational um, and causal in, in, in that aspect. Uh, Shay, did you wanna add something else to that? Yeah, so Doris mentioned two ways that there's funding. One is through property taxes and then one is per pupil per student in the school. And that is, um, that funding are two streams, but then there's an informal, unofficial stream of funding that comes through parents. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, parents are expected to be part of a school community, part of um, the school. <laughs> um, parents are welcome in and expected to fundraise for the school, expected to raise money. And I know that that isn't true everywhere in the world, but parents will have bake sales where they bring in cookies and cakes and they sell it. Now, that's that can raise, you know, a hundred dollars, but more affluent schools have auctions where they sell a week at a condo or they sell um, tickets to the opera and they make thousands of dollars in, in a night. So um, there's this informal channel of money that comes into our schools too, that is where you can really see discrepancies um, in the funding of different schools. Yeah, Shay, uh, on a personal note here, that was, I, I mentioned it in the beginning, I've been here for eight years and we have an elementary uh, schooler in, uh, here now. And even in, in, in preschool, on the preschool level, this concept was very new to me, what like the expectations on the parents and not that we don't want to help, but it's a different, um, it's a different setup here and a different, uh, different situation that, uh, 
families who move to the United States need to get acclimated for and with. <laughs> so, but in uh, terms of terminology, just to be clear, property taxes is referring to private property, correct? Yes. So it basically, if you wanted to put your feedback in a nutshell, we could say, uh, or could we say, I should ask that question, could we say the bigger our houses, the more tax we pay to the community that we live in. Yes. Yeah, because the property would be valued more. So yeah. the nicer the house, the, the yeah. you know, and yes, uh, and the value in that in, in that neighborhood, yeah, that would um, factor mm -hmm. into uh, uh, the amount of uh, money that you pay into property taxes. Uh, and one thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, like with these uh, parent associations in schools, that um, when you, again, looking at these uh, comparisons between more fluent schools, which are predominantly white students, not to say that student, international students or students of color don't attend these schools, um, as opposed to schools that um, serve predominantly uh, um, working class communities, uh, that when you think about this uh, in white privilege in that, uh, that in a more affluent school, um, it can be uh, a common thing that, um, that uh, moms or dads have the ability to take time off of work or to like uh, uh, um, insert themselves more into uh, the school community. Whereas when you're uh, if you're doing a stark comparison to a, a, a school that's low socioeconomic uh, status um, and a lot of parents in working class communities um, do work multiple jobs. So then when you think about these bake sales and, the, and these activities, um, some parents who would want to um, participate are unable to because they have to work multiple jobs in order to put food on the table and pay uh, for the roof over their head. And so again, it's like these stark disparities um, uh, arise uh, 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 in, you know, in, in schooling practices. So then, yes, of course, you know, like uh, a parent organization at, um, at a, uh, a lower socioeconomic school um, may only be able to get, you know, the $500 and then that's got to get, you know, like, what do we, what one thing does the school want to like pay towards versus like, oh, I have um, $10,000. What are we going to do with this? Um, and, and so in that way as well. Okay. Yes. And then there's also, um, because of funding differences, the ability to hire more teachers, to hire more personnel, hire more support staff. And so you will see, I go to my son's elementary school in my community there's 15 kindergarten well when he was in kindergarten there were 15 kindergartners his teacher a teacher's assistant a reading specialist and um a special educator that worked one-on-one -on -one with a special education student in that class there were four educators plus myself as a parent volunteer in that class with 15 students and then we can see in other, where there isn't as much funding, we have one teacher with 25 kindergartners mm -hmm. and it's a different experience. I totally agree, Shay. I had like, this was uh, um, big eye openers um, uh, when you live here. And I think St. Louis is, um, is pretty unique in terms of uh, the type of schools and the choices you have. Not every community has the um, large number of choices we find in St. Louis. And that leads me to my next question. So um, uh, the introduction of this first uh, of that question, you have already uh, covered in your slides because you um, have elaborated so well about um, the shift from the previously segregated schools to the now um, quasi integrated schools with a with a sacrifice of um, um, leadership uh, proportionally uh, represented uh, uh, better represented by minority groups. 
And so my question is that what schools see a higher percentage of racially diverse teacher and staff communities in the United States? And my question is what type of schools? So we have public, private, and parochial schools um, as a, I think these, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm not a specialist here, as we all know. Uh, so for our German audiences, parochial schools and Schulen uh, unter kirchlicher Trägerschaft. So I would say there are um, public schools. Um, there are charter schools, which were intended to be local, locally controlled um, public schools. So they're still funded with public money, but they do not have to follow the, the same laws. They are um, controlled by... Um, um, like a board of directors. Yeah, a board of directors, a charter. Yeah, they, they have a charter. So it has a board of directors and local community. Um, and then there are the parochial, which are the religious schools. And then there are private schools that are elite. So they are, they are um, not open to everyone, but they may not necessarily be religious. And so uh, one uh, caveat to charter schools is that if you notice that they're still getting, so one of the arguments uh, that like around uh, the funding for public education is that charter schools in and of itself are a uh, segregating uh, uh, um, system because uh, they are taking money from uh, public education and they're receiving that money for this charter school that, um, that can have a completely different uh, 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 gamut of rules and procedures and policies and, um, and the way that uh, like, oh, we have higher test scores because everything is really, a, a lot of things that happen in our schools in the United States is related to or connected to standardized tests. And so um, often this image, uh, this picture gets painted for charter schools saying like, oh, it's so great. Uh, we have all these things. It looks like uh, a beautiful picture from far away, but it's like a Monet a Monet, when you get up close, it's a mess because what's not happening is that, um, for example, students that need special education services are not getting those services uh, that, um, that are required by law. And, and so uh, there's a lot of discrepancies as to what happens um, in, a pub, in, a, in a charter school as opposed to public education. Uh, public schools having to um, adhere to those policies uh, um, brought forth by federal legislation and uh, in school policy. And then private schools, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, so we have found that, research has found that um, charter schools are the most segregated type of school in the United States. Oh, and wow. so rather than, rather than helping to solve the problem, of still having segregated schools, they have increased segregation because people who have what Bandera calls social capital, mm -hmm. so not necessarily money wealth, but just knowledge of school systems, knowledge of policy, knowledge of which school is the considered the best school, are able to navigate the system to get their child into the charter schools. Well, in a predominantly white country with predominantly white decision makers and policy makers, that system is white. And so white people tend to have the social capital to navigate that system because mm -hmm. of their um, culture. And so charter schools are often predominantly black or predominantly white, mm -hmm. um, not integrated. Um, private schools, um, I think it really just depends on the private school and where it's located. Mm -hmm. And same with public schools, it really just depends on where they are and where they're located. Mm -hmm. So our rural communities in the countryside um, tend in general to be predominantly white 
in our urban areas, there are more, there is more diversity, but some neighborhoods are more diverse than others. Um, and so when we think about what we call inner city schools, which are schools in the middle of the city, the urban centers, um, that has become code. So an inner city school or an urban school has become code in the United States for a school that serves black and brown children because it, it just has um, white people have left the cities. So they called it white flight and moved to um, other areas so that their students didn't have to be in integrated schools. Mm -hmm. So they moved to an area that was all white so they didn't have to be integrated. And then, I'm sorry, one more caveat about charter schools is that the reason why they can uh, boast around their test scores is that uh, they are at liberty to uh, dismiss students. Like you're no longer, like, uh, and so then students who are not following or performing these like norms and expectations that have been set up in the charter school, those kids get weeded out and so then, uh, you know, cream rises to the top. And so they're getting like uh, the best of the best of what, what uh, they're searching for. So that's going to be reflected in their test scores. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, as opposed to schools, uh, public schools that, um, uh, again, have to uh, meet the needs of all students. Uh, and that's more challenging in relation to um, this like standardized assessment. Um, uh, so it's a it's a contradiction. Uh, thank you. So this leads me to my next question, and uh, I really uh, um, and it ties in with a movie you have shown about um, this high school and the new approach to address uh, uh, the race and racism awareness discussion better. Um, do you have, um, would you have examples of successful integration and uh, well, the question was low racial discrepancies in either individual schools or school types that come to mind where you'd say, sure, we're doing a lot, we're trying our best, and here are some great examples. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Those are, there's a lot of sub questions in that. Um, so uh, providing examples of schools that have successfully um, integrated uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Integrated, integrated successfully integrated people students and where the debate is where, where people say um, I like to go to the school it's a diverse place I feel safe I feel recognized I feel good and that is um, um, recognized somewhere I taught in North Carolina public schools um, and there was a county called Wake County, which is um, the, the capital of the state is Raleigh. And so it was the county with the capital. Mm -hmm. And um, there are huge economic and racial disparities in that county because there's very affluent people. It's mm -hmm. the state capital. It's where the government and the policymakers and the lawyers and the doctors for those people live. Um, but then there were also um, their government housing um, and, um, and, and then um, tobacco farmers. So on the outside of the county were tobacco farms, which are typically pretty small farms. Um, and so each farmer doesn't make a lot of money. Um, and so in that county, the they used to have different districts. So the tobacco farmers' children had their own school district and then the inner city had their own school district and then the wealthy part of the city had their own school district. But what they did was they consolidated and they became one huge district. And the superintendent was an African-American man. And um, he, um, he did something that was a little controversial because he implemented busing and busing has a bad connotation in the United States because um, um, there was a history of black children being bused from their communities into these white neighborhoods when, when in the 60s schools were integrated. So 
However, the schools were diverse racially, economically, and there wasn't a bad school, a bad school in our district. Um, our schools were safe. Our schools were um, places where um, there were advanced curriculum options at every school. Um, some schools perform better on those standardized tests than others. Some schools were considered um, oh, the place you wanted to send your child um, if you had the means to move to that neighborhood or in that district. But as far as the integration went, it, it really worked. But what happened was the same with the busing from the 60s. It was the students from the impoverished areas, so the, the people with the least power in the situation that were being bused to um, other places. So like an hour bus ride there and an hour bus ride back. And so what the superintendent did was he changed that. And so it was half affluent students and half, you know, so everyone was being bused everywhere else. <laughs> well, then parents were like, I, my child could walk to this school, but instead they're being bused to another school. Uh -huh. And so it, it did help with the racial um, integration and um, it did not though, it took away that local sense of control and that local sense of community mm -hmm. that people in America expect to be able to have. Um, and so um, it was mostly white affluent parents that fought it and brought it down because they didn't want their student, they didn't want their child riding on a bus for an hour when their child could walk to a school in their neighborhood. And, you know, and Shay touches on that, that it was like the white affluent uh, parents. And so white uh, affluent parents have a louder voice in public education. Um, New York State it was found to be one of the most segregated um, uh, states uh, with their schools. And when you think about New York, New York State, you know, it's considered to be more liberal. And so, um, uh, and so again, when we're, because then there's also this idea of school choice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so uh, it's, it's not just simply integration. It's also thinking of, it's, it's going deeper and pushing into uh, ideas around race and equity. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, I recently listened to a podcast um, around like it was it's called uh, nice white parents. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in this, you know, I cannot give you an example personally from my experience, because I've taught my entire teaching uh, career has been in urban schools, and I've done that intentionally. Um, and, and so uh, in this podcast of Nice White Parents, uh, they discussed um, uh, this one specific district where um, they wanted to have an integrated school, but it really, the idea was still um, like parents, uh, white parents were there Prior, they were prioritized. And it wasn't until uh, more recently that uh, that this one specific school uh, in, in this podcast, uh, um, uh, um, Intermediate School 293, uh, is that, um, that they intentionally talk about race. They talk about equity. Mm -hmm. And they intentionally, they encourage uh, uh, teachers, staff, students um, to go around and find instances of uh, and name them of like, is this a, uh, um, is this student not being, you know, like there's an exchange between uh, kids and it's like, okay, was the student uh, not familiar with this black, with this black boy, or, or is it because she doesn't see him as knowledgeable? Why is she looking to her white peers? You mm -hmm. know, so it really highlights um, uh, these areas and the administrator in the school would have meetings and in those meetings, that's what they discuss with the parents. Uh, and that their parent organization um, was more diverse and that so it's not just simply integration and diversity it's actually uh, highlighting still that's not going to fix the problem the problem is is here in the U.S. is is talking about race 
talking about equity and how that impacts individuals because in, in our interactions, um, because that is uh, bringing a meta awareness and a critical awareness around that is what actually um, changes the, the landscape of schools. And so um, there have been, uh, like I've read studies on uh, schools that um, specifically uh, focused on um, uh, social justice uh, issues for uh, multilingual, bilingual children. And so everybody, it has to be a buy-in from everybody. And so one of the things that was pointed out in this podcast was interest convergence. So um, as soon as white families are impacted by a policy, then when these when that interest co converges with like wanting to change um, a school, that the push uh, and the change happens because it benefits uh, white families. And so. Yeah. That's a great, great uh, point, Doris and, and Shay. And what I um, uh, uh, what I find amazing is like I got like five or six questions uh, from talking previously when we set up this uh, the series here um, of people in Germany asking me, um, you know, how do how, how do teachers and students and families learn to speak comfortably about race because you had you had this nice slide in there in your presentation with uh, and I took this note today I don't see color I only see my kids uh, which is um, uh, I, I believe many people would have this assumption that is a well-meant uh, statement this is people who are trying to do good and then um, this is not this is not the easy way, as you have already elaborated about. So how do um, how do uh, do teachers and families learn to talk safely here? And then the second question that is it's a big question I know. Uh, the second question to that that I got from several. Uh, families in Germany who have lived in the States before. It's very interesting. So they actually envy in the United States for their teacher training that I, uh, I talk to families where they would say, well, um, I actually took teacher training in the United States and part of my education was racial awareness. And then you teach in Germany and it doesn't, it's, um, uh, it's, it, it's not a, what is it? Uh, it's, it's not an obligatory part of the curriculum. It's basically a choice. So, and uh, maybe this is also a chance to talk about our own university and our approach, like how the College of Education handles that part of teacher training for us and where it leads to and what it aims to do, like to make people more comfortable and bring them put them on the right square so both sides can both sides can feel good because I think it's so hard for everybody involved you want to be fair you want to be nice and then uh, um, to everybody and it's not always um, you don't always know the trick. <laughs> I guess you know you like, use the word nice okay mm -hmm. and want to feel good and mm -hmm. the thing is is that part of the work is feeling uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so you have to feel uncomfortable because uh, that's where the disruption comes in. Um, and you know, for myself, I uh, I teach everything from a, a critical perspective because um, you know, again, going back to my 13 years in the classroom, I always stayed in the classroom because I knew that I would have the most impact with children in that setting. And so moving into the role of a teacher educator, um, I see that as, you know, this is where I'm gonna have the most impact with uh, um, young adults who uh, have chosen to go into the teaching uh, profession, which is very challenging. And, um, and part of that is developing uh, 
critical, um, culturally relevant, culturally sustaining pedagogues. And that um, having that understanding um, of how uh, uh, race and language are policed in schools and then ways to disrupt uh, that thinking and different approaches. So um, I, so then my, my uh, um, analogy for this, which draws on Frere, uh, you know, ripples create waves. If you try and go directly up against a system, it's like running your head into a brick wall. But the way I see it is that ripples create waves. And so then if I am uh, teaching uh, um, pre-service teachers to um, engage in critical discussions mm -hmm. with, their, with their students um, and creating those spaces uh, to engage in those conversations and being real and being, um, and say, I can't speak to that, but you know, let's talk into this. Um, is that more, uh, it's, it's a critical consciousness, like this awakening, those are going to create those waves that mm -hmm. I see um, will begin to uh, um, push towards uh, uh, changing our current, uh, the way we approach um, uh, our public school systems. Right, and we're focusing today on race, but there's other inequalities in um, our society that manifest in our schools as well. Um, gender and science and mathematic careers, uh, we see a discrepancy in the number of girls who take advanced science, mathematics, and computer classes. And then that leads to who gets careers in those fields. And those are high paying, high demand fields. Um, and so critical consciousness applies to understanding the way that power and privilege and oppression and marginalization um, work in regards to race, as well as gender, as well as um, able-bodied um, language. Um, so there's critical consciousness around. I'm, I'm Shay, I'm so glad you're hitting on that because uh, last week we, um, we also had this question that I actually wanted to ask in every single session here, who decides who you are? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and we had that last week from Matt Taylor's uh, psychology perspective. And now if you transfer that into school setup, and I had pre-discussions with our German partners and several of the German partners are either people of color themselves or they worked with people of color or they're raising mixed race kids uh, or there are teachers in the classroom. So who decides who you are? Um, how is that, how is that, is, is that uh, addressed in the school? Um, is that, how does it manifest in the schools? Well, I see it as, um, you know, again, like how Shay had mentioned that our policymakers um, are white, old white men. Mm -hmm. um, that's who is uh, voted into, um, into like our, um, our government. And so then, um, so first, who's deciding the curriculum? Who's deciding uh, what's valued and what isn't valued? Mm -hmm. um, it is the dominant uh, um, hegemonic uh, structure of white men that are making those decisions. And so then, uh, again, that's a point to make very clear to pre-service teachers and to teachers so we have these policies coming down. And so then it's really important to take an activist approach um, and a critical approach to say, to disrupt that in the sense of like, uh, when you're teaching, uh, teaching counter narratives. Um, I mean, there's textbooks now here in the United States that have whitewashed uh, slavery mm -hmm. and made it, uh, like, oh, well, you know, it was okay. And it wasn't okay. And so then, um, and again, it's, a, it's uh, and there's, there's uh, individuals that, you know, are saying that um, uh, 
you know, there is no systemic racism. And again, those are coming, those, those thoughts and ideas are coming from uh, uh, white individuals. Um, and, and so there's a real, a real like dearth in understanding. Um, and it's not because uh, they're, um, they're, it's not because they're illiterate or dumb or whatever. It's, it's that there is an area, there's a gap in critical understanding um, in, in our population. And so um, I see that as a role, um, like what UMSL does mm -hmm. and really um, centering our work on understanding these systems of oppression and, and, and taking a, a critical look at um, mm -hmm. That, uh, at the work that's being engaged in. Yeah, and identity is, is performed. So um, W.E.B. Du Bois talked about, we're all multiple people. We are who we are. We are who we think we are, and we are who other people think we are. And so um, students may be one person at home, but a different person in school because every person is making decisions in their social context about whether they're going to accept the view that the, the people in that situation are viewing them as, or if they're gonna reject that and perform in a different way. And so going back to that implicit bias, and we said, you know, if a teacher thinks that, oh, this student doesn't care about education, the student can either re accept that identity or reject that identity. And um, it takes energy to resist. It takes energy to fight. And when you're not the person in power, like in classrooms, it, when you're the student, and if you're constantly having to resist what teachers are saying about you or thinking about you, um, you know, that it it can become um, a self-fulfilled prophecy where what the people in this situation think of you is what you end up thinking about yourself. Shay, I want to take that, uh, that being respectful of everybody's time, I want to take this uh, one word out of your comment as a capstone and as a, a segue to uh, the outlook to the next uh, to our next events here. You mentioned energy. So uh, yesterday and also last week, I have talked to uh, people in Germany, and we had hours of discussions about this topic because uh, the idea of the speaker series is also to. Uh, use the recordings to use the discussions as uh, for uh, potential bigger discussions with students or like college students or high school students uh, in a transatlantic context. But uh, referring to the term energy, somebody said to me yesterday, Liana, and that was a person of color, um, we are exhausted. We are just exhausted from this discussion, from who's doing what, what's doing, what can we do right? And I ask, what's the right way? And, the, and he said, and I really liked and appreciated that thought. He said, his response was, we just need to hang out more with each other. We need to have unstructured discussions with like non-bias. And I said, well, in the, you lived in the United States before here, Sometimes it's off. It, it's sometimes it's it's about opening that door first to, for the readiness for getting together and having that unstructured discussion. And that is just a personal impression. Again, I'm not a specialist in race and racism matters, but that takes me um, to first of all thank you both for today for a very very good coverage of what it is like in uh, in American schools and hopefully for more discussions, maybe with uh, uh, students from both sides of the Atlantic next year sometime. And I would also like to take this opportunity uh, to uh, announce our next two speakers. The next event will be on November the 10th uh, with Professor Todd Swanstrom, uh, who will talk about racial and spatial injustice in the St. Louis metropolitan area and what that means 
uh, spatial injustice will actually tie in with our discussion today about zip code education. So where do people live in the United States in those urban areas? And why is that so systematically uh, racist? <laughs> Uh, and how have those uh, community been developed? That will be in focus. And uh, Professor Swanstrom has worked uh, for many, many years with our South African partners. And he also has an affiliation with the University of Dusseldorf and got a prize um, uh, last year in the um, German American uh, year Wunderbar together. So uh, he has had exposure to both sides. And then on the uh, to both sides of the Atlantic. And then in December, uh, on the 4th of December, we uh, will have our, uh, assist, uh, our Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Tanisha Stevens here to talk about uh, the role, the important role of, uh, of the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusions in American universities, because we don't see that same mirror in uh, in Germany yet. And that was a question um, and the need that was addressed by our German side. And uh, Dr. Stevens will bring uh, one or two of her team members as well. So uh, with that, thank you very much everybody today. Um, and uh, see you next time. Okay, now it's just the four of us, right? <laughs> so, Bob, can you hear us? Wonderful. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks again. What happened, to, uh, what happened to William? Where's William? Where's Shatner? Oh, I uh, switched it. I mean, I can bring him back. <laughs> I mean, yeah, come on. Oh, oh. <laughs> hang on, hang on. There we go. <laughs> Uh, oh, one thing that I wanted to add, you know, like how Ashe had mentioned the that's a lot of energy, and then you had mentioned like it's exhausting. One thing that I would like to add is that um, that you know white individuals taking the initiative to um, educate themselves, like it's one thing, like you know, like well, you know, you know, like well, what do I do? What can I do? Um, it's also you know. Uh, also being self-motivated to um, engage in that, uh, that material. Yeah, uh, and I feel like I, I, I'm surprised. I'm, again, I'm a newcomer to this whole topic. And I thought, uh, Shay, you and I, we had this pre-discussed a little bit when we first met, uh, got together about today. Um, I thought with me working internationally and always being challenged with being tolerant and uh, open to other cultures and uh, having been exposed to racism, uh, unfortunately, numerous times in a not so pretty way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I thought I had this awareness, but I think everything that 